When I was 17, I visited the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, and I came across a room that was seemingly empty. There was no art on the walls, but there was one interesting feature. The lights were turning on and off in five second intervals. I looked around to make sure I wasn't missing anything and noticed a gallery label on the wall. The piece was work number 227, The Lights Going On and Off by Martin Creed. As the description aptly notes, the content of this work is almost nothing. As a cynical teenager, my initial reaction was that this was the stupidest thing I had ever seen. I couldn't get past the fact that so many artists would die just to have their work exhibited on a tiny fraction of wall somewhere in this museum, and meanwhile this jackass is using an entire room just to turn the lights on and off? In my mind, the only art here was that little plaque trying to explain how this empty room is supposed to be profound. I guess I wasn't alone in feeling this way because when Martin Creed won an award for this piece as exhibited in a museum in London, a woman took it upon herself to hurl eggs at the gallery wall, claiming, painting is in danger of becoming an extinct skill in this country. Imagine you clicked on a YouTube video, and this is all it was. How quickly would you get bored and exit out? Maybe you'd skip ahead a bit just to make sure you're not missing anything, only to find it really is just an hour of this. But okay, what was the title and thumbnail that led you to click on it in the first place? If the title was Work Number 227 by Martin Creed and you were looking for a video of that piece of art, then you found exactly what you were looking for. If the title was simply Lights Turning On and Off, One Hour, then you probably wouldn't be mad if that's exactly what it turned out to be. If the title was The Greatest Piece of Art of All Time, you might feel like you're getting trolled when it turned out to be this, but that might be kind of funny in a way. At the risk of sounding like a bullet point in an Art History 101 class, the context you view it in and the expectations you have about it change how you experience art. If you ask me today what I think about work number 227, I would say I actually think it's kind of brilliant and for exactly the reasons my 17-year-old self hated it. The fact that an artist is taking up an entire room in one of the most prestigious museums in the world just to turn the lights on and off is actually pretty clever, and I would argue it intentionally forces the viewer to challenge their notions of what counts as art. The inevitable critique of this type of minimalist modern art is always, well, anyone could do that. And yes, to use a popular example, anyone could technically duct tape a banana to a wall, and anyone could at least try to convince a museum to install an electrical timer in an empty room in order to turn the lights on and off. But most people would probably never come up with those ideas, and more importantly, even if they did, they wouldn't have the artistic reputation or connections needed to convince any museums to take them seriously. Martin Creed didn't start his career by calling museums and asking them to turn their lights on and off. First, he had to build his reputation by making a wide variety of pieces, including paintings, sculpture, and performance art. Now, there is a conversation to be had about what it actually takes to get noticed and gain a reputation in the art world, how much of it is luck and how much of it is just the people you know, and how much of the insanely high prices that rich people pay for these various works of art is really just a money laundering scheme, but set all that aside for now, because this video is about content. If you want to upload, say, an image of an egg to Instagram, or a video of a room with the lights turning on and off to YouTube, you don't need any sort of artistic reputation. All you need to do is make an account and click upload. But unlike having your work exhibited in MoMA, which virtually guarantees that thousands of people will see it, the biggest factor in determining how many people see the video you post online is, of course, I don't even want to say it. I'm tired. Aren't we all just tired of constantly thinking about this? I miss the days when you'd go online and the stuff you saw was just the stuff that was online. I'm not even necessarily talking about a time before the algorithms, I'm just talking about a time when most people were blissfully unaware of them. Now, you start watching some idiotic video about a dude making ramen in a bathtub and you know it's just one of those food videos that's intended to anger you and to steal your attention, but you still just can't look away and you keep watching it, even knowing that by doing that, you're giving a signal to the algorithm to keep showing you more of those videos. And even now, the only reason why you're watching this video is because something in your past behavior signaled to the algorithm that you might like to watch it. And I'm very happy that when you saw this thumbnail and my title that I chose, that you decided to click on it and that you're still watching it. It's the only way my work has any chance of getting views, but it's all just so tiring and it feels like there really should be a better way. I just don't know what that would be. 
In researching this script and listening to various perspectives on this question, there seems to be a growing consensus among content creators slash artists who publish their work online that the so-called contentization of everything is destroying art. But what does that actually mean? Well, here's an example. On this platform, you could find a gorgeous documentary with beautiful cinematography and incredible storytelling that the creator traveled across the world to film and spent months editing. You could also find a video of someone reacting to another video and adding some mildly amusing commentary that took all of 20 minutes to film. And in the eyes of the platform, in the eyes of the algorithm, both of these are essentially the same. It's just content. And on top of that, it's quite possible, maybe even likely, that the React video has at least 10 times more views than that beautiful documentary. And this seems like a reasonable distinction between mere content and actual art. Content is formulaic, repetitive, and low effort. Art is challenging, creative, and rich with meaning. This seems like a reasonable distinction, but there are a lot of problems with it, because at the risk of sounding like a bullet point in a middle school art class, Art is subjective. 433 is a piece by American composer John Cage, and here is some of the sheet music to that piece. 433 instructs performers not to play their instruments for 4 minutes and 33 seconds. Here it is being performed by the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. Now, I could try to explain to you why this is actually a brilliant work of art. I could tell you that when the orchestra isn't playing, the sounds of the auditorium, people rustling in their seats, clearing their throats, that becomes the music. I could tell you that it forces the listener to truly appreciate and pay attention to the absence of music. I could try to place it in historical context with other similar works, explain that it may have been part of the inspiration for Martin Creed's work number 227. But much in the same way that 17-year-old me scoffed when he read a gallery label explaining that the lights turning on and off are art, you might simply conclude that 433 is the stupidest piece of music you've ever heard of. You might even say, that's not really music. That's not really art. Debating what counts as art is one of those philosophical arguments that seems especially pointless because the obvious conclusion is just that art is a word that means many different things in different contexts. Really, almost anything that humans create can be considered art from the right perspective. So maybe a better question is, why does certain art become popular? Of course, the answer to this question is potentially an entire semester of art history, not just a single bullet point, because the history of art is intertwined with the history of human technology, and the history of religion, and the evolution of various cultural values and socio-political movements, and I'm definitely not going to be able to piece through all that, so instead, I'm just going to talk about Casey Neistat. Van and I, my brother Van and I, had a television show on HBO um, that we sold to HBO in 2008, and that television show was exactly my daily blog. Very highly reviewed, but nobody watched it. It was on at midnight on Friday nights. Like, it, it wasn't a breakout success. It's funny, because all these years later, after making an HBO show, I was like, I don't want to be a part of this industry at all. I just want to do YouTube where I don't have to answer to anyone. Before Casey's incredible success on YouTube, he had already accomplished something that many aspiring filmmakers could only dream of. His own show on HBO. Except, as he points out, it didn't turn out to be quite the big breakthrough he was hoping for. Before the era of content, the mass distribution of artistic works was largely controlled by various gatekeepers. Publishers, record labels, art galleries, and film studios all helped influence and curate the type of work that was seen by the wider public. But it's not right to say that these gatekeepers decided what type of art got made or became popular. The evolution of pop culture is often a story of various underground art movements slowly gaining popularity and eventually being absorbed into the mainstream. One of my favorite examples of this is how the term indie rock, which originally referred to rock bands that weren't signed by major record labels, eventually came to just refer to a particular style of music when most of the well-known indie rock bands all got signed to major record labels. You could say that Casey Neistat is like an indie rock band who got signed to a major record label but then went back to being independent and in doing so finally achieved the massive success he was hoping for. You could also say that's a terrible metaphor, in part because as much as publishing on YouTube does grant you a lot of creative freedom, your work is still essentially being distributed by one of the largest corporations on Earth. The rise of user-generated content platforms like YouTube, 
or TikTok or uh, Vine, rest in peace, has often been called the democratization of art. On these platforms, the barriers to entry have been removed and the traditional gatekeepers have been replaced by, yes, I'll say it again, algorithms. It can often feel a bit mystifying why any given video or trend goes viral, why some creators experience meteoric rises to the top while others grind for years chasing only small moments of success. But in the case of Casey Neistat, it's not hard to see why his style of cinematic vlogging caught on. In many ways, what he did was show people that simply filming yourself could be done in a way that was imaginative, captivating, and dare I say it, artistic. At one level, cinematic vlogging was just a trend that became incredibly popular, but I also think it was an important step in the evolution of what people felt was possible on a platform like YouTube. When HBO saw Casey's work, they decided it was worth putting it on air, but they didn't think it was worth giving it a prime time spot or worth spending much of their marketing budget to promote it. When Casey's work caught on on YouTube, none of that mattered because he had found an audience that could watch his work at any time of day, and as soon as he clicked publish on the next episode of the vlog, it was instantly available to millions of viewers. Imagine you're in a movie theater, watching a film of a room with the lights turning on and off. Don't worry, this is probably the last time I'm gonna show you this. But the reason you're watching this film in a theater is because you're attending a festival of experimental films. And this film is by a well-known director whose entry to this festival has been widely publicized. Now, all this being so, you might still think it's the stupidest thing you've ever seen. But at the very least, you'll probably force yourself to sit through the whole thing so as not to look uncultured in the eyes of the other highly sophisticated festival goers. And you'll probably at least try to appreciate some element of the artistic statement it's making because it must be at this festival for a reason, right? On the other hand, if your friend invited you over, excited to show you the short film he just finished working on, and it turned out to be this, okay, this is actually the last time, you'd probably be like, I don't know, dude. Unless, of course, you and your friend are both really into experimental films, and he's simply showing you the final cut of his submission to the upcoming festival. Let me put all this in the most elegant philosophical language I can think of. Whatever weird shit you're into creating, there is probably an equally weird group of people out there somewhere who will enjoy consuming it. People who like to give advice on how to succeed on YouTube will often say something like this. You need to provide value to your audience. Now, for some reason, I find this advice kind of annoying, but I have to admit it's probably true. I think there are three main types of value that YouTube videos provide. Education, entertainment, and people camping in nature that you've become dependent upon watching because the soothing sounds of rain hitting a tent is the only thing able to calm your endlessly racing mind, allowing you to finally drift into the dark embrace of slumber. And here again, there's the temptation to say, aha, that's the distinction between art and content. Videos that are purely educational, like productivity tips or tutorials, those are just content. But watching my favorite up-and-coming group of sketch comedians parody what it's like to get trapped talking to a guy at a party, that's art. But this immediately falls apart because it's simply not true that art can't be educational, can't teach you skills, or provide you economic benefits. Art can and does do all of those things. But okay, if we're being a little less strict with our definitions, there is some content that just feels more artistic than other content. If you've ever seen a video essay by the channel Horses, you might have been struck by the unique imagery and overall aesthetic he uses to convey his stories. All the choices he makes just feel a bit more unexpected, creative, and risky than so many other fairly formulaic video essay creators. Not me, of course. Another channel that's recently seen an explosion of popularity is Life of Riza. Many have found her work to be a breath of fresh air that features beautiful cinematography and personal storytelling that unfolds at a balanced pace and provides an antidote for the quick cuts of Mr. Beast-style sensationalism. And if you ask me, a man filming himself carefully setting up a tent in the Australian wilderness and cozying up in it with his dog while rain falls gently all around might be the highest form of art there is. Really, there's tons of beautiful artistic work on YouTube, but there's also tons of dry, unoriginal work that would strain many people's definition of art. 
The crazy part is that no one person will ever see more than a tiny fraction of the work that is uploaded to these platforms, and more and more the work that we actually do see is increasingly dictated by technological forces we barely understand. And as creators, as artists, it feels like the best we can do is to try and make the right content in order to resonate with some audience that will allow us to carve out a space, however small it may be, in this massive, churning void. Imagine you're in an indie rock band. Bet you didn't think that metaphor was coming back again. And you've put in the hours and hours of work it takes playing local shows to build up a following in your hometown until finally one day a record label notices you and decides to give you a contract to record an album. One thing that you can count on is once that album is finished, the record label will in most cases make a concerted effort to try and promote it because they put money into making it and they want to get that money back. Even if the album doesn't do so well, you can at least know that there was a concerted effort made to make sure people are aware of it and get to listen to it. If you're on YouTube, aside from maybe a tiny fraction of creators in the upper echelon, there's never really going to be a person who takes interest in your content and actively works to promote it or tries to make sure that the algorithm doesn't pass it by. And in many ways, this is a good thing. Of course, record labels and other publishers still exist, and many different types of art are still heavily promoted across various channels, but more and more that indie rock band doesn't care so much about playing local shows, and instead is spending a lot of their effort trying to get a song to go viral on TikTok in order to finally get a record label to pay attention to them. Because today, many of the old and new ways all just blur together, and it's exciting and terrifying because success can seem simultaneously so close and yet so far away because there are just so many people who all want the same thing. I made this whole video without stopping to ask, what is content? Patrick Willems does a good job of explaining that in his essay titled, Everything is Content Now. But it's all right there in the title, and you already knew it before you saw it in writing. Everything is content. But if everything is content, maybe nothing is. If everything is art, maybe nothing is. It's all just me as a 17-year-old standing in that room watching the lights turn on and off. 329 million terabytes of data are added to the internet every day, and maybe none of it means more than anything else. None of it has more value. But that doesn't quite feel right. Because we're still humans, and we get to decide which string of ones and zeros we like better. Which cluster of pixels gives us more joy, or heartbreak, or just a quick chuckle? And it's all too much, but also never enough. <laughs>